As you know, on Sunday night or Monday morning of every week, we post a new expository semiotics explaining why we would choose which lectionary readings. But in these readings, our dream is and our, our desire is to help you read the signs and fondle the details and spot the seminal metaphors, the condensed signs and the stories that are key for preaching to a digital culture. So strap on your seatbelt and join us as we prospect our passages for today. Once we here, welcome you to the Len Talk for the second Sunday after Pentecost. And we have some incredible passages I'm really excited about about uh, the one that I picked to spend a little time with. But um, let me just go through a few of the ones that, um, and just say something about the ones that uh, are here that you also might wanna, might wanna consider. The, the Psalm is um, one of my favorite Psalms still, although it has been somewhat ruined to me. Uh, this is Psalm 42 and 43. I don't know why. This is very unusual because they put two Psalms together. And I haven't had time to do the research to find out why Psalm 42 and 43. But I love, I've always loved Psalm 42 and and, and uh, you do too. And, and you know it. Uh, deep calls to deep is in this Psalm. And I that phrase that nobody can get away from. Deep calls to deep. And and we live in a world of deep fakes, um, and we need some deep reels to go with those deep fakes, and, and the need f need more and more for depth when everything is so surface and shallow and and uh, superficial. So the call to the deep, the call to go for a deep faith, for a deep trust because we have a deep Jesus. But the psalm begins, As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul panteth after thee, or longs for thee. Beautiful metaphor. It, it's somewhat ruined to me because, what is it, almost 40 years ago, somebody came up with this song, this praise song. And uh, I, for the first three months, I loved it. I, I couldn't. Couldn't stop listening to it. I just love this song. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul panteth after thee. And and just, it was it became an earworm. But you know what happens after an earworm stays in there for a while? Uh, it bores its way through your skull, and you don't want to hear it again. And 30, 40 years later, we are still singing <laughs> this, As the Deer. And well, will somebody please give that deer some water, and so it can stop panting. Uh, next time, and I'm I'm hearing this like, still as as a staple. Um, there there are some songs that get better with age, like like Prime Rib and and Wine, but some songs have a short shelf life, and you need them you need them for the moment. But you don't keep singing them 20, 30 years later. You go on to other things, and you get new new lettuce and new cucumbers, and new vegetables, and, and uh, this this has a short shelf life, but it's still, we're still singing it, and um, and so whenever I, just bring it some water, or I'm from Appalachian culture, um, we love venison, so let, let we somebody shoot that deer, and just take care of it, and at any rate, some unsanctified thoughts about uh, Psalm 42, even though I, I still love it, I still um uh, read it but i gotta when i read it i gotta get that that song out of my out of my head galatians 3 i mean who how can you say sweet how could you resist this passage galatians 3 23 to 29 and one of the great passages um of the of, of the scriptures as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. In other words, as Paul put it elsewhere, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in and through me. 
And then comes this incredible passage that was so revolutionary. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And when this was released into the bloodstream of history, the, the revolutionary power of this one passage has changed the world, literally turned it upside down. That's how important this, this little passage is. So, yeah, I even had, then, then you have the story of the Gerizim demoniac. I love, I love this, uh, this, this story, especially the mystery, and we're going to, this is going to relate to the, the, the First Testament passage I did choose, that after Jesus healed this Gerizim demoniac and, 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 and um, sent him back and, and released him into the community as free and whole and healthy. He didn't, he didn't just scare him. He healed him. Everybody got mad at Jesus. <laughs> it says that all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them. They were seized with great fear. And so Jesus got into the boat and returned. Um, no good deed goes unpunished. I mean, this is the, this is all of us. It doesn't mean that when you do good and powerful and wondrous things happen in the course of your ministry that people are going to affirm and applaud and acclaim you. It, it means in many ways, um, you just become a bigger target. And especially the, the garrison demoniac was released of the demons. They went into the swine, but they also filled the spirits of those, those people whose capital investment in pigs had been destroyed. And because if he can do this, what more can he do? Um, but, the, but the passage I want to I spend time on is this great... Now, I, I'm, let me, I'm going to start with a confession. This is one of the first passages I preached on in my ministry. And I've not preached on it since. Because the first time I preached on it, it was a disaster for one little line. I'm going to tell you what that line is. I want to get to it, I'll tell you. But I've been afraid to preach on this passage ever since. And this is a long, long time ago. This was one of the very first, like maybe the second or third sermon I preached in my, in my ministry. We're talking about, I'm in now my, my early 20s. And I'm I'm so captured by the story where you got Ahab and, and uh, Jezebel and they're out to, to take on Elijah, the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. And, and you got the, this challenge, this duel of Yahweh and Baal and Asherah. Jezebel's God was Asherah and Ahab's God was Baal. And so Baal, he got 450 prophets of Baal and she got 400 prophets of Asherah, they got together at Mount Carmel and they had this duel, the dueling gods at the Mount Carmel Corral. And we know the story. We know who won. And this was maybe the greatest achievement in Elijah's life. And what happens after it? Well, um, he goes into a pit of despair and depression. He came to a cave, spent the night there. And the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? Um, Elijah um, went into the wilderness, came and sat down under a solitary broom tree and asked that he might die. It is enough, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree, fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up! Eat! He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. Angel Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up! Eat! Otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank and then went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, 
the Mount of God. At that place, he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I've been very zealous for you, the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. They are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now this is where you got to know a little bit about Canaanite religion. Because both Baal and Asherah, both those religions, the gods were known for their, the, the wind, the thunder, the rain. They were, in some ways, weather gods that had power and control over all of the elements. And so that's the backstory to this very famous passage. Now, there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks and pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after an earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for you. They're, they're coming to take it away. The Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. Um, the story goes under the title, mostly, Elijah under the broom tree. Now, you want, what, what is a broom tree? Well, a broom tree that is named after, it's a very short, shady, almost a shrub. They call it a tree. But its branches, they used to make brooms. So, hence the broom tree. Um, there was not much shade, but there were, there were many branches. So, it was, it's still called a tree. And Elijah is depressed, he's despairing, and um, he's, he thinks he's the only one, I alone, and I just don't have it anymore, I, I just don't have the strength to go on. And that's the problem, he's operating under his own strength, not God's strength. And that's when depression hits the worst. This is really a story about deep despair and depression. It technically has a name, and this has been true in my life and, and anybody else here that struggled with depression, post-achievement syndrome. After you have succeeded in something and, and pushed as far as you can and, and done as well as you could do, and you may have done well or almost well or whatever, but in that aftermath of the achievement, you hit the pits. Um, well, when was Jesus's greatest uh, temptation? He, he, he was baptized. His whole family showed up for his baptism. He heard the best words anybody could hear. Um, you are my beloved Son, you bring me great pleasure. I take great pleasure in you, is another another translation. And he goes from there where? He's riding the crest of a wave. But hear me, a wave once crested turns into a trough. Um, and then he hits the pits. And he enters the, the wilderness. And, and this is when he's most vulnerable, he's most weak. And is when Satan comes and wrecks havoc, or tries to at least. Um, the, you, you think of um, times, and here, here we have the same thing. Um, Elijah, after a great um, moment of achievement, goes into the pits. Um, Jesus, in the, in the story of the Gerizim demoniac, has a great moment of signs and wonders and and then, uh, then goes into, into the pits. Depending, we all have different EQs. Um, and some people go down into, the de de uh, down into the valley as much or more as they go up on the mountain. Others live in the valley. Okay. 
and um, look up at the mountain. Very few reside for the whole life on the mountaintops where everything is a, is a special rapturous moment of exhilaration and enthrallment and enthronement. So there are some people like that. So we all have different EQs, different emotional quotients, different emotional lives. But there will, there comes to all of us this roller coaster, this sine curve, where it goes up and it goes down, and it goes up. Nobody can stay high forever. And um, how do you handle these these times of deep despair and and depression, even uh, suicide? I mean, Elijah here, just take my life. I'm done. Uh, so he's suicidal, and um, suicide comes at that some of the peaks and pits of of depression there's 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 metaphors for depression uh, we could talk about noonday demon black dog black cloud waterboarding of the soul thick fog a lot of different ones um but it's this is a form of mental illness and let's just be clear before covid the statistic was 46 percent of us of adults will suffer from some form of mental illness in their lifetime. Now, this is before pre-COVID. I think right now, post-COVID, this is a whole culture of PTSD. We're all in post-traumatic stress disorder. So the amount of of this kind of despair and 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 um, on the edge and anger and 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 um, anguish and anxiety is is huge. Um, so this is the story of Elijah. Elijah under the broom tree, but it's also a story of how do you and I, how do we, how do you get out of these pits? How do you get out of this deep, dark fog? How do you get out of these? How do you get rid of your, what Churchill called his black dog that followed him wherever he went? Um, God wants us to be healthy and whole and, and well. And, and so here's a story of when Elijah gets depressed and suicidal this is the divine prescription the divine therapy for elijah and it may not be a bad therapy for us as well now we may need some other kinds of intervention through the medical establishment and in many cases this is really imperative uh, and we should not be afraid to seek professional medical help but this is the help that many times we forget uh, and this is actually essential and the bedrock on which the other supplemental help is built and so you see a pattern here of how does god treat elijah's suicidal thoughts and depression Notice this is not self-care. Oh, how I hate that phrase. Everybody's talking about self-care. How's your self-care going? No, this is God care. God cares for us. God cares for God's prophets. God cares for God's instruments. God cares for you. And God doesn't want you like this. And so God, if this is part of the pres divine prescription for God care, and that's the problem with self-care is that, that Elijah was trying to do it on his own self, on his own strength, and he, he couldn't. Not, none of us can either. So, first thing, and notice God puts him under shelter, a broom tree. Puts him in the shade. Now, this is why... Um, I've been afraid to preach on this text because the first time I tried it, I said that notice God gave Elijah this the shade and the shelter, and that we cannot get the shelter ourselves. We need God's shelter and the shade that comes from God. And then I said very dramatically, have you ever tried to sit in the shelter of your own shadow? Except it didn't come out that way. <laughs> it didn't come out. Have you ever tried to sit in the shelter of your shadow? It, and when I said it the wrong way, and you can imagine the way I said it, 
in non-Jesus approved language. I, um, everybody kind of smirked. And so I thought it was, I thought I'd done a funny. So I, I did it even more dramatically the second time. I mean, think about it. Have you ever tried to sit in the shelter of your shadow? And then when it came out, I realized what I had done. And, and it was the whole rest of the server. I have no idea what happened. Uh, I was so embarrassed. I was so horrified. And one, one elder of the church, it was the Presbyterian Church, uh, Central Presbyterian in Geneseo, New York, and one elder of the church came out to me afterwards and, and put his arm on my, my shoulder and said, Len, just go home and practice seashells by the seashore. So that's all you got to do. Just practice seashells by the seashore. I'll never forget. I just said, thank you. Thank you, sir. I will do that. I'm so sorry. I embarrassed you and everybody else's Lord. And, um, none of those Presbyterians came to church to hear that. Trust me. So the first thing was shelter and shade. The next thing was sleep. The next thing was sustenance, food. And the last thing was mission. Um, now, let's just look at these real briefly and what they tell us about God's care for us. Not self-care, God care. First of all, um, shelter, shade. We all need to find a place to recuperate when we are in despair and depressed and down in deep distress. We need a safe place, a safe shade. And for we all have, I think we all have a different. There are sacred landscapes that have healing powers. I I really believe this. I mean, and you need to know partly what is causing that despair and that depression, so that you can you can know what landscape your soul needs, your spirit needs to to recover, um, and and to take care of your body in a sheltering. Of, of God care. Now, some of us, depending on where you are and depending on what God, what the mission is God's prepping you for, but some of us need to head for the hills. I mean, the, this is basically my native um, sacred landscape, the mountains, the hills. I, I, um, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. From whence does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, and I feel that help from the Lord most from the hills, but some people feel it most from the water. And there, there's something about the water. And sometimes your soul does need some water, just some suckering and just the, the sustaining and, and floating and power of the water. There's this beautiful, the poet David Sutton has this wonderful line, the music of not going anywhere, the waves make against the shore. Sometimes we're just constantly running, running, running. And we need, we need the music. Listen to this, the music of not going anywhere that waves make against the shore. When you're going someplace. That's why a lot of people go to the water to, to vacation. Um, because when you go on someplace all the time, you just need the music of the waves crashing against the shore, but they're not going anywhere. And they're coming back. And there's that rhythm, that rhythm of going, ebbing and flowing. But if you're, if you've gone through a divorce, if you're start, if you've been fired or going through a whole new job or starting over in any way, it's desert time. You need your spirit may need the desert where everything gets bare and back to essentials and you're you're faced with the stark reality of what it means that you now are going from zero to one, which is the largest, longest distance of the universe. The distance from zero to one is farther than distance from one to any other number. And so you need that that sacredness of the of the desert. Um, but you need shelter, you need shade, you need some shadowing. Find the shadow. You cannot, you've been in the blare of the heat, the blare of the attention, the blare of, and blaze of the crowd long enough. So, first of all, where's your broom tree? Second, sleep. 
Do you know? Do you know what exhaustion does to us? Do you know what? Um, how awful it is to just go around and try and be your best when you are totally blasted. Here, here is Barbara Gilbert in an Alden Institute publication, Who Ministers to Ministers? And she's quoting an anonymous pastor, and I'm just going to quote it. I am supposed to move, this is the pastor, I'm supposed to move from sick bed to administrative meeting to planning to supervising to counseling to praying to troubleshooting to budgeting to audio system to meditation to worship preparation to newsletter to staff problems to mission projects to conflict management to community leadership to study to funerals to weddings to preaching. I'm supposed to be in charge but not too in charge. Administrative executive sensitive pastor skillful counselor public speaker spiritual guy politically savvy intellectually sophisticated and I'm expected to be superior or at least first rate in all of them. I'm not supposed to be depressed, discouraged, cynical, angry, or hurt. I'm supposed to be upbeat, positive, strong, willing, available. Right now, I am not fulfilling any of those expectations very well. I am tired. Um, you, you, when, you cannot be at your best when your, your bag's under your eyes are weighing you down and your spirit is carrying all this baggage. Sometimes we just need the healing power of sleep, of rest. And then notice what comes next is get up. Now get up and eat, but first we got to get up. God's not going to feed us in bed. There's no laying around. Um, get up. Get some exercise. And get some, get on your feet. Um, and start exercising those, those muscles that, that God has, has given you. And then God calls us to a mission and sends us out. And notice in the story that God does this once. And... Um, and Elijah's still too tired. And so God has to do it again. It goes, God puts him through two prescriptions of this method of, of shelter, shade, sleep, sustenance, exercise, and, and food. And when Elijah gets two treatments of it, he then can encounter the God of the the God of Yahweh, not the God of those Canaanite religions where God is found in the fire and in the rain and in the whirlwind and the winds and in the thunder, but the God of, of stillness. Now, stillness doesn't mean you're, you're not moving. It just, in the words of Willie Nelson, my favorite Willie Nelson song, still is still moving to me, but that still place of a turning world, because that's where the dance is. Mission is a dance. But all of us, we can get so needy and so despairing and literally so depressed. So... Any of you listening to this, any of your people needing this, please don't forget the basics as you seek professional help for these things. Just remember, it may be as simple as, as you need to get away from this. You need to get away from the scene. You need to get away from here and just sleep. And then exercise, take some walks, eat. And hear God's call, a call for the next mission that God has given you, because we are all on mission, in mission. Your baptism is your ordination certificate as a ministry. You have a ministry of the body. It's called the priest of all believers. But your baptism is also your commissioning as a missionary. Every one of us is both a minister and a missionary. We have a ministry to the body and a mission in the world. But we can't do it 
when we're despairing, depressed, weak, vulnerable. God wants to take care of us. This is God care. Shelter. Sleep. Um, exercise. Sustenance. Service. 